what is, what is this construct of quality of life? And I think it's worth walking through this a little bit because there's sometimes some confusion um, and we use this term very broadly, but we don't always have a real clear conceptual understanding of what we're talking about, perhaps from a research perspective or from a clinical perspective. So when you Google quality of life, or you put it into PubMed, this will be the definition that comes up most frequently. This is the World Health Organization's definition of what quality of life means and represents. And so in their words, they say that it's the individual's perceptions of their position in life in the context of the culture and value system in which they live, and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. I actually used this in publications and in presentations for years without really fully having my head wrapped around it, so I think it might be worthwhile at this point just <coughs> driving home on a couple of the elements of this. First of all, this idea of the individual's perceptions. Another way of saying this would be the subjective perceptions of the person. We really do feel that quality of life, where possible, quality of life assessments where possible, need to be subjective in nature. There are times when you can't do this. So for example, when you're working with somebody with intellectual dis disabilities, or you're working with somebody, a child, for example, who can't necessarily report subjectively on their quality of life, in those circumstances, you might use what's called a proxy rating for the person's quality of life, but where possible, we really want to be measuring it from the perspective of the individual living with a particular condition that we're studying or working with. And I'm going to show you some data to try and unpack this a little bit that comes from Kieran O'Boyle's lab in Dublin from his research group. And he developed a pretty neat measure called the CQOL, which is a way of assessing quality of life on an individual level within one single person, either at one point in time or over time. And so the way this works is that you give the patient or the research participant a kind of a pie and you can move the parts of the pie around to make them bigger or smaller and to give you an idea of how much of a particular condition that you're studying is impacting on the person's quality of life. So if the symptom bother part of the pie is bigger, it necessarily makes the quality of life part of the pie smaller. And so you might imply that the symptoms of the condition or the pathology associated with it are actually impacting more on that person's overall quality of life. I'm going to show you how this works in practice. So this is this is one individual patient that we're talking about here. And so this is a person who, who's at the, at the end of life. Um, they're an end stage oncology patient, somebody who, who, has, uh, who has cancer and is really within the last two or three months of their life. And in this particular study, um, the researchers asked different people to unpack or to, to weigh in on how much they thought the person's cancer and symptoms were impacting on their life quality. And this is the nurse's perception of what was happening. You'll see that the nurse was thinking that about 62% of this person's uh, quality of life pie was being impacted by the symptoms of the condition. So about 38% uh, of the pie was, uh, was left of their quality of life. So a fairly fairly large impact of their physical disorder on their ability to have satisfaction and enjoyment in their life. This is the doctor's perception of what was happening within the same patient. And from the doctor's perception, the symptoms of the condition, the fact that they were intubated, that they were in pain, for example, were really impacting on their quality of life. And for, from, so from their perspective, the disorder itself was having even more of a toll on the person's enjoyment and satisfaction at the end of their life. What happened with the patient? When the patient was asked to do the same exercise, this is what they perceived. They perceived that, and I can remember the narrative behind this, they perceived that um, it's pretty, you know, the symptoms were pretty, were, were not to be disregarded, but they were actually placing more emphasis on other things at this point in their life. So for example, spirituality, family, connections with other people were of more priority in terms of their quality of life as they under understood it than the actual symptoms of their condition. Does that make some sense? And so it gives us a little bit of an idea of how um, our perceptions as clinicians of what a person is experiencing, prioritizing, waiting might not always be accurate. <clears throat> 
The second piece I just wanted to weigh in on a little bit here from the WHO definition is this idea of uh, quality of life perceptions being dependent a little bit on your context and your particular life circumstances. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about stu a study that we did which looked a few years ago at quality of life in people with bipolar disorder. This was a sample of uh, 35 patients with bipolar disorder. They had bipolar disorder type 1 and type 2. We also interviewed a few family members and a few expert, cl expert clinicians who dealt with people with bipolar disorder very regularly. And we talked to them about quality of life as they understood it and the factors that they thought might be associated with this construct. And this is what they told us. They told us that social support was important to them, that the ability that they had to deal with stigma, whether they internalized people's representations of what it meant to live with mental illness, self-stigma. They talked about spirituality and religion. They talked about independence and they talked about identity, their sense of self and their independence in the healthcare system and their independence in the family context in which they live. And I think the results from this study also give us a sense that when we're starting to drive down on measuring quality of life, that we need to be looking across different types of domains of well-being and that for bipolar disorder there might be particular things, I'm starting to think as a clinician, that may, may be particularly important for people living with bipolar disorder. First of all, we really think that where possible, quality of life assessments need to be subjective in nature. I think when we're measuring quality of life, we probably want to be looking at different domains, a variety of different areas of well-being in the person over time. And we think from some of our early work that there may be particular facets of quality of life that might be particularly important for people with bipolar disorder.